Good evening. Our conference for tonight will be a very most important topic for each and every one of us as Catholics. And the topic is the importance of perpetual Eucharistic adoration and Eucharistic adoration in general and how it is our salvation. There's three important parts and aspects to our conference today. The first one is, what is perpetual adoration and Eucharistic adoration in general? Number two, why is it important for each and every one of us as the individual adore? And number three, and most importantly, how Eucharist and perpetual adoration can be the salvation of our world and the resolution of the present day world crisis. Perpetual adoration. Perpetual Eucharistic adoration is defined as perpetual prayer before the exposed Blessed Sacrament, continued by successive worshipers day and night without intermission. As we say in the vernacular of those who promote perpetual adoration, it is adoration 724, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And Pope John Paul II, in an address he gave to the Eucharistic Congress in Seville, Spain in 1993, spoke of what it meant to him. He said, it's for me a special joy to prostrate before Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament in an act of fervent and humble adoration of praise to the merciful God, of thanksgiving to the giver of all that is good, and supplication to him who is always able to intercede for us. Again, as I always say in the course of my missions, those of us old-timers over 50, remember that when we were taught by the nuns, they taught us the four parts of prayer. And the acronym I learned, you may have learned this, my mother learned it, was ACTS. A-C-T-S. And in this acronym, acronym of prayer, we see what the Holy Father said, is the essence of what we do in the Holy Hour. Because people all over the country say, what do we do during perpetual adoration? What do we do in our Holy Hour, which is our hour of power and our hour of conference with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And I always tell them about Acts. First, we adore. That's what you do during the course of a Holy Hour. Then, we make acts of contrition, or some would say reparation. Then we make acts and prayers and thoughts of thanksgiving, Eucharista, right? That's where the word comes from in the Greek, thanksgiving. To all the things, good things God has done for us and for our family. Sometimes we overlook that, only see the negative. And make acts of supplication, or some would say petition, putting our petitions before the Lord for our loved ones, for our country, our nation, and our worlds. Perpetual Eucharistic adoration and all adoration in general, 40 hours or shortened hours, is the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is really and truly present in the Eucharist, body and blood, soul and divinity, really and truly and substantially present, wholly and entirely present in his human nature, in his divine nature, altogether unified in his one divine person. So for Petro Eucharistic adoration, then, is the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ perpetuating and continuing the real presence of Jesus Christ and the Holy Sacrifice in the Mass. Because we know that the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, by definition, is defined as the continuation of the sacrifice of the cross and of Calvary and of the passion and of death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In perpetual adoration and Eucharistic adoration in general, we join the sacrifice of our time with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross in order that we might bear our own crosses and endure our own cavalry better. In fact, my favorite definition of Eucharistic adoration when we see the monstrance, monstrance meaning to show, showing what? Showing the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ is that it is the moment of consecration frozen in time. 
In other words, when the priest says, this is my body and this is my blood, that moment in which the, we have the transubstantiation, in which the whole substance of the bread becomes the whole substance of the body of our Lord, and the whole substance of the wine becomes the whole substance of the blood, then at that miraculous moment, that moment is frozen for our contemplation and for our penetration of our hearts with the mercy, the love, the power, and the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I like to say that adoration is the continuation of the continuation. In other words, our hours of adoration are continuation of the growth, the holiness, that very deep and personal encounter and communion, the becoming one with our Lord Jesus Christ and receive Him in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so this growth and sanctity and holiness due to our hours of adoration before Lord Jesus Christ leads us to eternity happiness, to the epitaphic vision in heaven where we shall see God as He is. You hear a lot of talk or when you were parents, those who are young parents now, you tell your children, be careful of the company you keep. And why do you say that? Because you know that the kind of friends you have ultimately becomes the kind of person you become. And if that is true on the natural level, how much more is that true on the supernatural level? That if we keep company with our Lord Jesus Christ through the hours of adoration, that hour of power and that hour of conference with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, how much we radiate the virtues, the chastity, the charity, the mercy, the wisdom, the courage to witness that our Lord Jesus Christ did on earth. Pope Pius XII in his great encyclical, Mediatridei, 1947, which is really the mother document of the Second Vatican Council in her liturgy, spoke of the grace-filled presence of Jesus Christ after Mass. He said that the Eucharist is at once sacrament and sacrifice, but it differs from the other sacraments in that it only produces grace, but it contains in a permanent manner the author of grace himself. So, the practice of adoration, which began in the Eucharist, was kept in the tabernacles for those who were sick and could not come to Mass, and the developing sense of fidelium, the developing sense of the faithful, of the people, that this is Jesus in there. That's Jesus. Why don't we bring it out and put him so we can adore him in a more direct and intimate form? This was the beginning of the practice of Eucharistic adoration, which does not take away from our devout participation in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. You know, we have all kinds of crazy rationalizations. People come up to me sometimes around the country and they say, well, Father, I spent an hour with Jesus in the uh, Blessed Sacrament Chapel, so I don't have to go to Mass, right? Wrong. Eucharistic adoration and our participation in the Mass come together. One enhances the other. We participate better in the Mass we spend more time in prayerful adoration of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our participation in the Mass enables us to appreciate and to enter into communion more powerfully with Jesus during our times and hours of adoration outside of Mass. Someone might say, well, why can't we just adore Jesus in the tabernacle? Why do we have to have him up there on the monstrance? And that's a good question. Well, the analogy I like to always draw out is this. What's the difference between talking to a friend on the phone and talking to him face to face? We understand that difference, don't we? So if we understand that, that it's a more intimate and fuller communication. You see their facial expressions, their body language. Get more of a closer communion with them when you talk with them directly. Then we understand the importance and why it is so important to have hours of exposed blessed sacrament for us to adore Jesus. And so perpetual adoration, then, is really a profession of our faith in the real presence of our Lord Jesus, who He is and what He is, and who and what the Blessed Sacrament is. And it's the visible sign of those who adore Jesus Christ, of our belief in the real, true, substantial, sacramental, and personal body 
blood, soul, and divinity, presence, and humanity, presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the more devout we are in adoring Jesus, the greater and stronger is more reinforced our faith and knowledge in the real presence and ability to communicate this to others in the real presence. And so the more society believes in the real presence, the more they adore. The less they believe in the real presence, the less they will adore. So this is why it's so important, especially as we do missions, to take pains to bring a lot of Eucharistic adoration literature on the theology and the devotion and the history of the Eucharist and devotion to the Eucharist so that people in educating themselves and deepening their knowledge of the Eucharist will be encouraged to come more to adore our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the more you know the one you love, our Lord Jesus Christ, the more you know of his love for us and each and every one of us, and the more we want to love and reciprocate that love in turn by coming to adore him during hours of adoration. Briefly then, having investigated a little bit about what perpetual adoration is, I think it's important to turn to our second part of our presentation. Why is Eucharistic adoration good for us as the individual adore? Perpetual Eucharistic adoration and Eucharistic adoration is good for each and every one of us individually because the perpetually exposed presence of the incarnate and flesh God-man, Jesus Christ, radiates the constant and unremitting infusion of holiness and grace that produces many vocations, saves many souls and marriages, tremendously increases mass attendance, the right least stimulates prayer and devotional life, and vastly increases the holiness and sanctity of the people of God and is indeed the solution of the present crisis in the church and will ignite a worldwide moral conversion and renewal. You know, I can give you instance of instant after instance of how perpetual adoration has changed forever for the good, the individual door, and their families. You know, just two weeks ago, some of you were listening, when I was on the radio, my sister had not been to church for ten years. She came and she made a public profession of the weakness of her faith and that she would come and worship again and to strengthen her faith by entering into perpetual and Eucharistic adoration. In parishes where there is Eucharistic adoration, perpetual adoration, I have never had a bad mission. Never. In places where there is perpetual adoration, I've seen dozens of vocations flourishing. In places where there's been perpetual adoration, even when there was a lot of parishioners, I've seen parishes grown from, say, 500 families to several thousand families. Building churches, grade schools, junior highs, even high schools. This is the power of Eucharistic adoration. And to cite a scriptural evidence, Let's take a look at the story of the paralyzed man in the stretcher. How many of us remember the story of the paralyzed man in the stretcher? Remember that? Okay. Four of us, there's four men carrying him. They try to get to the house on ground level. What happened? They couldn't get through. So that represents how often we try to use human means to try to solve supernatural problems. It doesn't work. So what do we need to do? Just like these men, they went up the side of the house and they went up on a roof. Anyone who's ever played basketball or football, you know how difficult it is, right? Somebody turns an ankle or a knee to lift that dead weight. Imagine the faith it took for these men to do that. And they made an opening in the roof and they lowered this paralyzed brother of theirs before our Lord Jesus Christ in his presence to be healed. And remember what the scripture said? It said, seeing their faith, Jesus healed that man not only of his physical paralysis, enabling him to walk, but healed him of his spiritual paralysis, of his sin. Guess who are the stretcher bearers of today? It's you and I. We are the prayer warriors that are going to take our loved ones paralyzed by their sins, mortal sins, paralyzed by their fears, paralyzed by their addictions, paralyzed by their obsessions, paralyzed by their lack of faith and their skepticism. 
And we're going to put them during our hours of adoration in front of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his presence. And Jesus, seeing our faith, will heal the paralysis, spiritually and even physically, if it's his divine will, of our loved ones. And you know, every so often we get some skeptics, and they say, well, Father, you know, I know Joe so-and-so, and he spent six hours a week adoring Jesus. I don't see any changes in life. But you don't know that. We can't make that judgment. We don't know what's going on inside somebody. And even if that person wasn't changing, then I will simply say, you have to pray with persevering faith. You have to persevere. What's the analogy I like to use? Do you ever see water dripping on a rock? One drop at a time, right? Doesn't seem like it's doing anything, does it? At first. But... When it keeps dripping on that rock, there's a little depression that starts to form, isn't it? Then, there's that hole. There's a little hole starts to form. The hole grows bigger and bigger, and boom, the rock splits open. Like my sister, I prayed for her for ten years. Then all of a sudden she comes on national EWTN radio. Wow. Whoever figured that? That's what power of Eucharist adoration is. Practically speaking for our families. We have to remember, in speaking of this power, that in the consecrated Eucharist is the same Jesus present now to us in body, blood, soul, and divinity, really, truly, substantially present in his human nature, in his divine nature, in his divine person, that was present now in 21st century America as he was in 1st century AD Palestine. Therefore, that's true, which it is then he can work the same powers of miracles and healing and conversion that he did 20 centuries ago. But what's that condition? Faith in the power of the Eucharistic Lord to perform miracles. Pray for a miracle. You've heard that even with Protestants. But with Catholics, of course, we pray for the miracle worker in the Eucharist himself. We don't need no miracle healers. we got the one right here. The healer our Lord Jesus Christ. Mother Teresa said in reply to the question, what will convert America and save the world? Her answer was prayer. What we need is for every parish to come before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and holy hours of prayer. Of course, Mother Teresa's communities have been doing this, the missionaries of charity, since about the early 70s. And look what's happened. And the same as things that happened for the missionary charities can help for us, the Fathers of Mercy, and we've been having our Holy Hour since 85, revived our community, and can be the same any parish in the world. John Paul II then spoke of the great moral benefits of perpetual Eucharist adoration in his great encyclical on the Eucharist, Nominice Cheney, 1980. He said, Jesus waits for us in this sacrament of love. Let us be generous in our time and going to meet him in adoration and contemplation that is full of faith and ready to make reparation for the great faults and crimes of the world. May our adoration never cease. That's what perpetual adoration is. Unceasing adoration. Why? Because it's simply a reciprocation of the love that God has given to us. Does God love us without end? Yes then we should turn in gratitude and love Him without end. And that's, of course, what perpetual adoration is, and expressing them. So it's in Eucharistic adoration and meditation that we fully enter into His love as contemplating God's love for us and His real presence before us. We affirm that in perpetual Eucharistic adoration and in all forms of Eucharistic adoration, the Sacred Heart is really present before us, living and beating in the chest of a living human being. We have this heart-to-heart adoration and love communication with God. You know, I like to say, as I travel the country, that quite often when I'm gone, and I'm gone sometimes for weeks at a time from my home in Kentucky, our own Kentucky home, I come back out of sorts. What's the first thing I do? I go to our chapel where our Lord is present, Eucharistic presence, And I go in like a lion, and I go out like a lamb. And the answer and the question is, why? 
Because when we spend an hour of our Lord Jesus Christ in Eucharistic adoration, we have spent an hour of power, an hour of conference with the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But He doesn't just take away our sins. He takes away our doubts. Takes away our fears. Takes away our weakness. And He gives us His peace. He gives us serenity. And He gives us the courage and the insight to deal with the trials and tribulations and problems of our state of life. St. Julian Peter Amar, who was the founder of the Blessed Sacrament Fathers, who continue to promote perpetual Eucharistic adoration today, wrote how Christ in the real presence is to be imitated. He says, we can love as Jesus loved us on earth and others because we share with the God-man a real, physical, unfleshed human heart, and flesh human heart. We imitate especially in Jesus' loving heart, his patience, his love, his obedience, and especially his humility. St. Margaret Mary Ellico said devotion to the Sacred Heart was devotion to the real presence in the Holy Eucharist, and vice versa, of course. So why the devotion to Jesus' real presence in perpetual adoration and all Eucharistic adoration increase our holiness and our growth in the strait of grace and likeness to God? Because to believe in the real presence as strengthened by perpetual adoration is to strengthen our faith in every mystery of the faith, the Holy Trinity, the Redemption, and the Incarnation. And let's keep in mind, as we reflect on this, that the greatest saints and orators and writers and catechists of our church have done their greatest work while they're sitting before the exposed Blessed Sacrament. St. Thomas Aquinas, he levitated on two occasions in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Bishop Fulton Sheen, Always oh, so spend an hour, right? A holy hour with God. Every priest, every person, seminarian, every person, really. My old teacher, Father John Harden, if you couldn't find him anywhere, you could always find him in the chapel, writing his great catechisms that continue to be published today. So perpetual adoration, then, the essence of this real presence, basking in his glow, so to speak, is to imitate Christ. And the more we learn to imitate Christ, the more we grow in His holiness and divine love and charity. And the more we grow in divine love and holiness, we grow in our capacity to sacrifice ourselves and to suffer for the one who loves for us, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are strengthened in perpetual adoration in the very presence of Jesus Christ to give up our time, our desire for rest and entertainment, and even our very lives for Christ. We're not ready only to sacrifice, but to do so joyfully. You know, I had a wonderful experience in Boston last week. A wonderful woman from Africa. She's now a U.S. citizen. She's a trained nurse. She owned a home taking care of the elderly. And she gave it up and turned into a house of prayer and pilgrimage for priests. And now she's conducting seminars. She's conducting great seminars on the Sacred Heart at the local church. And she said, you know, when I gave this up, I was free, even though I was earning a great salary. And now... She works from 3 in the afternoon to 11 every day except Sunday. And she did that to free herself. For free herself not only from economic burdens and everything, but to free herself to go into the Eucharistic Chapel in her local church, which has perpetual adoration, and be the adorer from 12 in the morning to 12 in the midnight to 5 in the morning. Her single-handedly she is keeping open the night hours of perpetual adoration. We have instances of heroism now, right now, even as we speak, and will continue until the end of the world. And so, just as Peter, St. Peter, could perform a naturally and humanly impossible task of walking on water as long as he held the gaze of Jesus, we too can achieve, with God's grace, the naturally and humanly impossible task of winning our eternal salvation and the moral reconversion of the world as long as we hold the gaze of our Lord Jesus Christ in adoration. In perpetual adoration, then, we come full circle to the full reality of God's love made visible to us 
in his exposed real Eucharistic presence. Remember, God created the world out of his sheer love. He didn't have to create us. He didn't create the world. He created the world out of his love without any necessity constraining him. Love became man, according to a classical definition of the Incarnation. And God made man, decided to transform bread and wine into his very body and blood and soul and divinity in instituting the Holy Eucharist. He did not have to. But God, out of sheer love, instituted the priesthood to perpetuate, there's that word again, the miracle of transubstantiation so that Jesus would remain present amongst us. And when we consider the magnitude, the greatness of God's love and of his allowing self, allowing himself to be really and truly and totally present in the monstrance, we are fired with the love, devotion, and the wisdom and courage will never die, but instead will carry us on the wings of the Holy Spirit. Remember the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they encountered Jesus there. And remember their hearts started to burn when he started to explain the scriptures to them. When they were down, they thought, well, we thought this was the Messiah, and now he was crucified. And now the risen, living Messiah came to them, professed what had to happen, the passion, death, and resurrection of the Messiah, who was present to them, they invited him to their home, and when he broke the bread, they recognized our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And so what did they do? Did it stop there? No. It continued, because they were so fired up with love and devotion by the Eucharist and presence and power of our Lord Jesus Christ, they became apostles of the Eucharist. They became disciples of the Eucharist, Eucharistic soldiers, and they started evangelizing and proclaiming the Eucharist to who? The apostles. And that's the challenge of us for today. The challenge for us today is to become Eucharistic soldiers and to become Eucharistic apostles to evangelize the power of the Eucharist and the Eucharist's presence to the world. To come and tell them that in every Catholic church you can find the true body, the true blood, the true soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the Messiah here in his human nature as well as divine nature is, is present to us today now as he was 20 centuries ago and will until the end of the world. And so now, after establishing the importance of Eucharistic adoration for each and every one of us, now we broaden the context in our final chapter, part three, and see how perpetual Eucharistic generation can bring about the moral reconversion of America and the resolution of the present crisis in the church. The greatest miracle that Eucharistic adoration can work and does work is the miracle of faith. If we have faith and all it entails, prayer, courage, the courage to witness, and the knowledge of the faith, then all miracles are open to us, especially the miracle of the moral reconversion of our country and the world. If our Lord already loved us so much, He became one of us and took on our human nature and suffered for us, we will not perform the small miracle of the reconversion of the world after His redemption. So perpetual adoration, and perpetual Eucharistic adoration, is the way each and every one of us can contribute to the resolution of the present world crisis. Perpetual adoration unifies each and every one of us. You know, people all over the country say, I, I feel helpless, I don't know what to do with this international war and terrorism that we're facing and the divorce and strife in our families and in the world. So what can we do? I said, spend an hour. Spend an hour with our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. Make that your hour of power and hour of conference with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You know, you hear so much talk today about closing borders, making fences to keep people out. But what we need to do today is open up the doors of Eucharistic adoration and let people in and become transformed by the Eucharist. Right? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what the Holy Scriptures say. So no, perpetual adoration is a new crusade, a Eucharistic crusade that will expel the infidels from our midst and establish in the times a new and glorious age, the age of Eucharistic adoration that indeed will trigger off the renewal of the world. But as I said before, 
We need to be patient. We need to persevere in adoration. Because if we persevere, then the great fruits and the greatest fruit of the Eucharistic adoration becomes present to us and within us. And that greatest fruit is peace. And the final analysis, true peace, can only come from perpetual adoration. St. Augustine defined peace as the tranquility of order in the absence of conflict. And what is this absence of conflict that comes from the tranquility of order? It is peace of heart. It is the heart which theologically is the center of our desires, our very inmost desires and will in our decision where true peace is won. And today's civil warfare and strife is an exterior manifestation of the war raging in men's hearts. We don't have peace without in the world because men and women are not peace within themselves. For example, this great number one terrorist who was just assassinated just a few weeks ago. You read his life story, it's sad. Because why did he provoke so much terror throughout the world and cause the death of thousands of people? Because he himself was not at peace with himself. He grew up in a very disadvantaged broke background and was a thug. And so tried to give some kind of religious covering to his thuggery. And who is the truth that moves us to this tranquility of peace and good order? It's our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And even before the birth of Christ, we see many attestment to this fact. The rising sun will guard our feet into the way of peace, Zechariah and the Benedictus. Jesus in healing the sick said, go in peace. Jesus at the Last Supper said, peace I bequeath you, my peace I give you. A peace I give you the world that cannot give. This is my gift I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and afraid. So peace then is fruit of the grace and the Holy Spirit. And peace is only achieved when we cooperate with the grace. And perpetual adoration brings true internal peace in our souls by the constant calming effect of the very real presence of the living God in our midst, who is Jesus Christ. And as Christ come, the stormy seas that threatened the apostles in their journey from one side of the sea to another. We just saw that last week, last week's gospel. Then Jesus really presence in our midst calms the many passions, grudges, evils, and conflicts in our soul arise from not acting in conformity with God's will in the Blessed Sacrament. In this total supernatural peace, then, the most powerful means to obtain this peace apart is from Jesus Christ, the most blessed sacrament. It is here in prayer before Jesus Christ exposed and fully present to us to receive the light for the mind and the strength for our will that brings us true peace, the tranquility that only comes from the possession of the fullness of truth, Jesus Christ, really present. And he said, Peace be with you to the apostles. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. Have courage to overcome the world. Come to me, all you are labored and burdened, and I will give you strength. So come then to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, really and truly present to us now, as he was in first century Palestine. Come to Jesus, really and truly present in perpetual adoration, to see the strength and enlightenment, to not only shoulder our private burdens, but those of the world, and achieve the moral reconversion of our church, our nation, our world. And so we end with the same kind of exhortation and invitation that Lord Jesus Christ gave to the apostles, Peter, James, and John, during his agony in the garden. He says, he said, could you not watch one hour with me? And our Lord Jesus Christ asks us today the same question. Could you not watch one hour with me for the end of terrorism, end of war, end of abortion, and for all the assaults on human life and the insults on the dignity and sanctity of marriage and all the problems we have? The Lord's given us 168 hours in the week. Let's give him one back for the salvation of the world. May God bless you. May our Lord Jesus Christ be praised.